God with half a mind and to launch prayers toward God with half a heart and to sing hymns to God with words that cannot, they cannot recount five minutes later. I won't ask for a show of hands, of course, but I think that the wise philosopher's critique is spot on for us, including for the preacher this day. We grow accustomed in our Christian worship, in our observance of the faith, in thinking that this can't really be about us. Certainly, we're not those who are in need, for here we are in the church and behaving pretty righteously for the most part. When we think that way, and we do think that way, I think, we're tempted to um, miss completely the point of Christ's incarnation, the point of his teaching and his living, which is that we all stand in need. William Willimon, a Methodist theologian, put our need in plain language. He said, despite our alleged progress and our good intentions, we really do need saving. We can't seem to help ourselves by ourselves. We set out to do good and unintentionally we cause great harm. We try to set the world right with our armies and our power only to cause an even bigger mess. We say to each other, I love you, when what we really mean is I love me and I want to use you to love me even more. We habitually attempt to organize the whole world around ourselves, curving in upon ourselves, living just for ourselves. We launch forth to make the world safe for democracy only to bomb and make mayhem among the very nations we presumed to save. He concludes by saying, is it any wonder that in an embarrassingly short time after the creation of humanity, Genesis says sadly, the Lord regretted making human beings on the earth and he was brokenhearted. Truly, what we need is not better programs or more money to bring about democracy for the world or to perfect the existence of human habitation on this planet or to resolve the matters of interpersonal, relational, and competencies on an ever-increasing, ang anxious manner. What we really need is something we can't provide for ourselves. Mercy. We need a God who is merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And that is exactly the very God that Scripture proclaims the very God that Jesus of Nazareth bore witness to, exactly the very God that we have come to know in our life, in our faith, a God of loving kindness, a God of mercy. You see, brothers and sisters, no matter who we are or what we claim to have achieved in our living, every one of us stands in need of mercy. It's the very thing that God wants to grant us. It's the very thing that God wants to give us. Mercy, loving kindness. But it's also the very thing that God calls us to take in within ourselves, have our lives transformed by it, and then live with it as the activating agent of our own lives. Mercy. We who are in need of loving kindness equally have the great call to show and demonstrate that mercy in all that we do and all that we say. And sometimes we're really good at it, and sometimes we're not. I'm convinced that none of us have the capability or the capacity to show mercy unless we fully understand that we have received it that we've received loving kindness, 
The stories that Jesus tells about those who are lost are really not about their lostness. That seems to be the focus for many people, those two parables that we heard. Jesus doesn't concentrate so much on their lostness, but upon the main character of the story's attempt to find them. The effort that has been made, the work that has been done, the effort to reach out in loving kindness and grace and to search out that which has been lost, whether it's the single sheep or the lost coin. Of course, those stories are not just about a shepherd or a diligent housewife who are the main characters of the story. They're about the power and the determination of God to show mercy upon those who are in need of mercy, full stop. That's God's intent, at least according to the witness of Scripture, to show mercy upon those who are in need of mercy, sinners like you and me. We gain then the capacity for loving kindness only once we've been transformed by it, by God's great grace toward us. This may well be the transformation that, of salvation that Scripture speaks of so highly and preciously and the theologians and others debate about what really mean, what do we really mean by salvation? What comprises our salvation? Could it mean learning to live with mercy, with loving kindness to one another? That seems to me to be a plausible definition of salvation. Learning to live how God lives, with mercy. One of my favorite singers of all times is a folk vocalist named Dar Williams. Some of you may have heard her. I've been listening to her and occasionally seeing her in concert since the early 90s. And I never tire of what is possibly my favorite of her songs. It's called The Mercy of the Fallen. It's a sweet song, but a strong proclamation of both the need to receive mercy and the call to give it, the power of mercy in this world. Here are part of the lyrics about halfway through. She says, I saw all the bright people in imposing flocks they landed and they got what they demanded and they scratched at the ground. Then they flew and the field grew as sweetly for the flightless who had longing yet despite this, they could hear every sound. Then the um, refrain, there's the wind and the rain and the mercy of the fallen who say they have no claim to know what's right. And if your sister or your brother were stumbling on their last mile in some self inflicted exile, you'd wish for them a humble friend. There's the wind and the rain and the mercy of the fallen who say, hey, it's not my place to know what's right. And the, and the many stars that guide us, oh, there's the weak and the strong and the many stars that guide us. We have some of them inside us. Point being of Dar Williams' little song, is that if your sister or your brother is stumbling on their last mile, then you would wish for them humble friends. Not friends who say, I know exactly what's right for you. I am among the righteous. I know what is good. And I know what to do. Dar Williams makes the biblical point, I think unwittingly, for she's not a Christian, I believe, but she makes the biblical point that we have been given mercy so that we might share mercy, so that our lives might be transformed by this loving kindness, so that we don't impose all kinds of uh, rules or obligations upon others, especially those who are weak or those who are lost or those who are stumbling on their last mile. We become for them, out of mercy, out of loving kindness, humble friends. For that is exactly a wonderful definition or explanation of who Jesus came to be for all of us. It is the mercy of God that we've received in Jesus Christ that can make of us this very thing, humble friends. 
The beauty of loving kindness is that when it is received, it has the, trans that has the power to transform us, to transform the one upon whom mercy has been shown. It transforms us not into the righteous and not into the perfectly good, for none of those exist, but rather into merciful and humble people who are willing to reach out in mercy to others as surely as they have received mercy from God. In Micah, the great prophet, we are told this, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. What does the Lord require of us? Justice, mercy, and humility. But the greatest of these is mercy. Mercy indeed. Amen. Together we affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Trusting in God's willingness to hear us when we pray, let us turn to God in prayer. Loving and holy God, we raise our voices in thanksgiving this day to you. We have lived yet another week that you have granted to us. We respond in coming to worship this day to offer ourselves to you as you have offered yourself to us in Jesus of Nazareth, in Jesus the Christ, 
the one who is the Lord. We are thankful indeed for each moment that we live and breathe, for all such moments come from your hand. Help us to know how precious, how precious our hours are here in this place, in this life that you have granted to us. And help us, O oh God, not to use those moments in selfish endeavor or on our own alone always. Help us to share these moments, share this life that you have granted us with others, for you have made us to live in community. The first humans you created and placed in a pleasant garden and asked them to share life together in community. Yet they strove after their own ways. So, O oh God, we mimic our ancient forebears. We strive after our own ways. We seek our own solace. We seek our own comfort. We seek our own achievement. And we forget. We neglect your ways, O oh God, and we forget that your love for us is from everlasting to everlasting that your love in Jesus Christ is a light into our path, that your mercy and loving kindness exampled, or given to us, rather, is an example for how life can be lived. Not just with you and you alone, but in community. Keep us mindful, O oh God, that you call us not to hold a grudge, not to remember every sin against us, every misspoken word directed our way, every heated thought enacted upon us. Let us forgive as freely as we have been forgiven. Let us show mercy and loving kindness as easily and as eagerly as we have received it from your hand. Make us mindful that you call us to imitate your son Jesus of Nazareth, that you call us to live in such a way that his love and mercy and grace would pour forth from us. And so open our hearts, our minds, our very eyes to those whom you send us to, that we might be a comfort, a healing in the midst of difficult times or sadness and sorrow. Make this so in our lives, O oh God, that we might learn to live by mercy in all things and at all times. In this same vein, we recall and remember a tragic day 21 years ago that shocked us, that appalled us, that caused us to consider what we would do to revenge ourselves or to avenge ourselves. Lord God, we remember that dark day on a bright sunny day that struck us right to the heart. We grieve for those that are lost. We mourn the great loss of life. And even so in doing, we mourn the loss of all life. We forgive our enemies, O oh God, for you have called us to love our enemies or those who purport to be so. This is a difficult endeavor for us, and yet you call us to do so. So in our remembrance of this great day of tragedy, help us, O oh God, to remember to love, to let that great sharp point of the day that inflicted us so be dulled by mercy by forgiveness, and by the light that dawns only in your love. Grant this to us as we move forward continually into the life that you grant us. We pray, O oh God, for those whom we have mentioned, for John and for Lucas, for good test results to come, for the people of the Sudan and the South Sudan alike. And now in this moment of quiet, we lift to you our own prayers written upon our hearts 
They are too deep for words. We ask you to read our hearts and know our souls. Bound together by your great love and mercy in your son Jesus Christ, we pray as your son taught us together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We do bring our joyful response, and this day marks the first of a series of brief remarks about the stewardship campaign called the Daring Hearts. And so for a moment, for Daring Hearts, uh, we've asked Robin Jennings, an elder in our church, the chair of our worship committee, to address us. Linda Dixon concluded her remarks in May, requesting you to think differently about stewardship by saying, I don't ask you, I don't challenge you, I dare you to. What immediately popped into my head was the movie A Christmas Story, and I dare say it did into Terry Wanzers as well, who penned his September newsletter article around that theme. If you're like us, you watch this holiday classic every year, maybe more than once, and you know all the hallmark scenes and lines. You know a major award, or fragile, or the bunny suit that no self-respecting relative should ever give an adolescent as a gift. This delightful movie is rooted in nostalgia, and oftentimes we're planted there too. We long for days gone by, simpler times when we erroneously recall as carefree, or at least better than the way things are today. Our memories have softened the details, and now the harsh realities of life then seem to have a bit of a rosy glow. Or maybe we look beyond our lifetime to the decades or centuries before we were born and think that those who came before us were the innovators, the doers, the dreamers, the givers. It's true, our ancestors who raised up this community of faith had a vision, a purpose, and a plan. And even as they were looking backward, they were also moving forward in serving Christ's people in this spot. They were teaching by their example how we can do likewise. So let me share another nostalgic tale that I think deserves our modern day attention. It's the story of Pollyanna, perhaps the most misunderstood fictional character of 20th century American literature. When most people think of Pollyanna, they think of an overly optimistic goody-goody who doesn't see the harsh reality of the world. The term Pollyanna has taken on a negative connotation, and you might hear people using the term apologetically. I hate to be a Pollyanna, or critically, stop being a Pollyanna. In fact, Pollyanna was not unrealistic or overly optimistic about anything. She was a little girl with a very poor but very wise father who recognized the duality of everything in life and taught her to play a game based on this idea. Pollyanna's game was known as the glad game. One day, Pollyanna's father, who was a church missionary supported by donations from the Ladies' Aid Society, received a long-awaited donation box for his family. Pollyanna, who had very few toys, had been wishing with all her might for a doll, but the only thing for her to play with was a broken pair of crutches. When Pollyanna started to cry, her father promised her that if she stopped crying, he would teach her to play a game that would bring her more happiness than any doll ever could. 
He taught her that in every situation, no matter how bad it might seem, you could always find something to be glad about if you looked hard enough. Pollyanna and her father played that game every day, looking as hard as they could to find the thing that they could be glad about in every situation. The more difficult the situation, the more fun and challenging it was for them. After a while, the game became automatic to Pollyanna. She often didn't even realize she was playing it. She had just trained herself to see the silver lining or what she could be grateful for in every situation. Pollyanna began to teach the game to everyone she met, and life-altering transformations started to occur for all who played. It is from a place of gratitude that I serve our Lord Jesus Christ, using my gifts and talents, my time, and my financial resources to further Christ's work in our community. It's not a game. For me, it is a way of life. I am grateful for the past and hopeful for the future and committed to make my todays meaningful. So I close where Linda Dixon left off, and you guessed it, it's right out of a Christmas story. I don't just dare you or double dare you to do likewise. I double dog dare you. Thank you, Robin. Let us bring our joyful response, our tithes and our offerings. Gracious and loving God, we dedicate these, our offerings this day, to your purposes in this world. We've heard the good news that your Son, Jesus Christ, came into this world to save sinners such as we. Help us, O oh God, to spread this good news of salvation in all that we do and say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, in Jesus Christ, we have received great mercy and loving kindness from the hand of God. Let us go forth from this place to share that mercy, that loving kindness with all whom we meet. For remember, we go not alone, but God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit goes with us now and always. Amen.